Before I begin my presentation, just I'd like to say just a few words about uh, Carl Keith O'Brien. As you know, he handed in his resignation to the Holy Father. Uh, in fact, he handed it in last November because his 75th birthday is on the 17th of March. And uh, so there won't be uh, a Pope then. Uh, the Pope just yesterday uh, and, uh, accepted the resignation now. And, uh, and, and, and as regards the Diocese of Edinburgh, uh, there'll be a, an apostolic administrator uh, appointed by the Pope to go in and govern the diocese, and that, that will be, I'm quite sure, a senior, a senior bishop, and uh, part of his job will be to uh, examine the allegations that have been made, and I think it would be very in inappropriate of me to say anything about that uh, uh, while that's going on. So that's my first uh, point. Um, so the three sections I want to speak to you about today. First of all, as I'm going out to, to Rome tomorrow, is thinking back of the, uh, uh, the four last popes we've had. I'm thinking of Pope John, uh, called the Second Vatican Council, and was, uh, I suppose, a great favourite with everybody. Good Pope John, he was called. He was humorous, he was down to earth, he was wise, he was, uh, uh, in, 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 a, in a good way, he opened the doors of the Catholic Church, and I think was one of the most beloved popes of recent history. Uh, and uh, uh, he issued a, a, a sixth letter called Parchum in Terry, so all about peace. Uh, and but what people loved about Pope John was his humanity, his jokes, his how many people work at the Vatican? About half. And uh, what about... Uh, I'm, I'm, I belong to the club of the family, all sorts of things. When he went to prison to see the prisoners, he said he'd had an uncle in prison. All these things endeared him by his just very humanity. He was a great man. And so was his successor, Paul VI, I think, who, who uh, had to conclude the Vatican Council. And I, I, I see him very much as a man of, of dialogue. He, he was the first... Pope uh, to travel abroad. He went to uh, Jerusalem uh, where he met the Patriarch and he went to India as well um, and he went to the United Nations to appeal for peace. He had a, a, very, a very difficult pontificate I think between uh, 63, 1963 and uh, 1978 just uh, trying to bring on and bring about the, the reforms and the renewal uh, of, the, of the Second Vatican Council. And then there was Pope John Paul I, or the, the only uh, last of the month. And we remember him, I think, particularly by his smile. Uh, and, uh, uh, and when he died, uh, then we had, as you said, unexpectedly, a man from a far country, namely uh, Pope John Paul, who was a, a kind of world uh, evangelist, opening the doors of the, uh, the church, <coughs> opened the doors of the world to, to, to Jesus Christ. He was... Uh, uh, he was an extraordinary man, and uh, I think again uh, will be. Uh, I think will be remembered for so many things. Uh, the light motif of his uh, of his papacy was already the dignity of the human person, the dignity of every human being, and uh, so we we remember him. I think with, uh, uh, with great affection, as indeed we will do also with Pope Benedict, Pope Benedict who. Uh, uh, who had a great veneration for, uh, for Pope John Paul. And he was to say to me, what is his legacy? I'd say the legacy of Pope Benedict is, first of all, the lucidity of his teaching. I ha in, in my uh, lifetime, I've never known a Pope who's been able to teach, to preach with such a clarity and uh, uh, precision and love of, uh, of the gospel of, of Jesus Christ. And uh, yeah, he's a teacher, and uh, I think he, he uh, we'll, re we'll remember him particularly in in uh, in this country uh, for his uh, the way he came over to the people here, not as a, a as austere, uh, severe man, but as a, a humble pastor, a shepherd, who, and it was very moving. I thought uh, when he he came here for those days in. Uh, in uh, 2010. So uh, the papacy is, is very important and the cardinals have a, 
a very big job to do. Uh, as I've said, I go to Rome tomorrow, and I'm going to tell you just for a, a few minutes what happens at a conclave. Um, first of all, uh, this is rather a very exceptional one because uh, the Pope has resigned and he's still living. So we don't, uh, as it were, wait for a funeral. We say thank you, as I will do with the other cardinals on Thursday morning when we'll say farewell to Pope, uh, Pope Benedict. And, uh, and then, then we go in, the cardinals go in to meet together. And I will be with them until the time uh, that they go into the actual conclave. So for, for about eight to ten days, we'll be meeting every day to discuss matters uh, uh, that concern the church, uh, which I'll come to. Um, uh, but uh, uh, as you know, I was present at the conclave in 2005 that elected Pope Benedict, and uh, it is a uh, it is an extraordinary. Um, and that's not just the meetings before, but when you actually process in to the Sistine Chapel. Uh, and then we had, uh, I remember we had a, a sermon from a, a Capuchin with who, who uh, and then to start, and then one of the cardinals says, Exeunt omnes, which means everybody go out. So all the, the, the MCs and the preacher, they all went out, and I heard the thud of the door. Uh, of the Sistine Chapel. I, uh, I remember looking round and thinking to myself that one of us is going to uh, go out of here with a different cassock on. And, uh, so, uh, as, uh, you know, so we, we all, there's scrutineers, three cardinals who are scrutineers, and one by one we go up and we put our vote into the, the golden urn. And uh, as you know, in the Sistine Chapel, you're facing Michelangelo's Last Judgment. And so it's a pretty solemn affair as you as you go up and you say before God, I think this is the man who should be the uh, the, the new uh, the new pope, and uh, and then you go you wait till everybody's voted and then the, the votes are called out one by one. Uh, I went over it through one interval just to have a look at the the place where the smoke went up. Is that in the Sistine Chapel? There's a little. Uh, uh, funnel which goes up through the roof uh, and, and there's some special stuff that has which makes black smoke and other stuff that makes white smoke and uh, I was just interested to see usually they can't detect the white smoke very clearly uh, anyway and then uh, the last time we, we, I think there were four or five uh, votes before it was quite clear one man was getting more than anybody else and he had to get 77 two thirds plus one and I remember going, uh, the, the, the senior cardinal, going up to Cardinal Ratzinger and said, Your Eminence, will you accept to be the Supreme Pontiff of the, of the Catholic Church? And we all waited. He said, No, I can't. And then he said, I accept as the will of God. And then he spoke. And then he said, What name will you take? So he said, uh, Kennedy. So he must have kind of thought about it the night before, you know, <laughs> before. You know, between you and me, not to be put in the paper, uh, I think I think all the cardinals had a name up their sleeves, <laughs> <laughs> just in case. And, uh, anyway, uh, immediately then he went out, and behind there's a there's a tailor, a Vatican tailor, who has three cassocks, three white cassocks, one large, one medium, and one small. And uh, after about 10 minutes, he came back in his white cassock, sat in the middle. And we all went up one by one and kissed his ring and declared our, our loyalty to him and our fidelity uh, to the faith with his, his guidance. And then, uh, and then he said, now we must go out to the balcony. So, he, so we followed him out to the balcony. And, uh, and then he, he was announced to the huge crowd outside. And then we went back and had uh, supper with him in the Casa uh, Santa Marta, the place where we were all staying. And uh, so it was a very moving event and a very solemn, uh, very solemn event indeed. Uh, so naturally now we're going to be thinking about the next, the next uh, pope. I think I'd like to say first, um, why, is it, why is all this so important? I mean, I mean, why am I a Christian? Why am I a Catholic? Why do I belong to the church? Why is the church important? Well, the church is important because it, it preaches and manifests, shows to the world uh, what we believe about Jesus Christ. 
that he is the salvation of everybody, that he lived and died and rose again, and he's with us still through his Holy Spirit. And I think that what Christian faith uh, brings to the world is what everybody wants, which is meaning and hope. Because I think everybody, whether they're religious or not, wants that to their life, meaning and hope. And we think we have a message that brings meaning uh, and uh, the, the biggest hope uh, to our world today. So first of all, if we're talking, if I'm talking about the challenges that face the Pope, the new Pope, I'd say first of all, uh, that obviously, in the light of what I've said, he has to be a, a, a truly spiritual man uh, who's, uh, who's able by his own faith to confirm the faith of other people in, in Jesus Christ. A faith that affirms that God sent his son to save the world. So that's number one. Uh, number two, I think he, the, the new Pope needs to be, he's a pontifex, and the word means uh, not only a, a high priest, but also a bridge builder. And I think this next Pope must be a bridge builder. Uh, and uh, that means, especially with his fellow bishops, but also uh, within the, uh, the, the, the courier, the people who immediately serve him. And, uh, and in that, there's no doubt that, that today that there needs to be uh, renewal in the church, reform in the church, and especially of government. How is the Pope, this next Pope, going to govern uh, the church? And uh, a lot of the bishops and cardinals think that it's got to be done perhaps in a more collegial way. In other words, those who rule the church, it's not just the Pope who rules the church, it's the Pope with the bishops. The Pope is essential, is a centre of unity and truth. But he, 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 uh, uh, he also cannot rule the church without a, a, a real association with the, with the bishop. So, as you know, there have been uh, troubles uh, uh, recently, in the recent years, and, and scandals. Well, these have got to be addressed. Uh, and especially uh, the, the Pope's own house has to be put in order. And uh, then I think the, the Pope has got to, the next Pope will have to be a man of dialogue. Uh, who dialogues with, especially, of course, with our, our fellow Christians, so that the, the quest for Christian unity, which will never, uh, never cease, it's not, uh, will continue. Um, and then there will be dialogue with other, other religions, other faiths, uh, Hindus and, uh, and Jews, uh, Buddhism, and especially, of course, Islam. Uh, and I think that that kind of dialogue with Islam is very important for the Pope, and indeed for all of us, if we're going to have peace uh, in our world. Um, the Pope is a, uh, he'll also look at the imbalance in our world, you know, between the rich and the, and, and the poor. Uh, very interesting, you know, I'm often asked, are we going to have a black Pope next time? Well, we could have a black Pope, we could have a South American Pope, we could have uh, an Asian Pope, you could have any of the, uh, the Cardinals, which could be uh, uh, could be uh, uh, elected wherever he comes from, and they could even elect somebody who's not in the not in the conclave at all, uh, somebody outside. And, uh, so I think um, uh, the field, as in that sense, is is open. Um, it is interesting, though, when we're talking about these other continents, how the, the governance of the church has changed in terms of the. Uh, ethnic variety. In, uh, in 1962, at the beginning of the Vatican Council, uh, all, pretty well all the bishops were white. Uh, and uh, uh, But now, and, and those bishops that were in Africa and Asia were all missionary bishops that came from Europe or America. But now, there are native bishops in Africa, in Asia, in, in, in America, South America, so the world has changed, uh, and I think that the church is no longer a Europe, as it were, centered church, but it's truly global. Uh, 1.2 billion people. Uh, and uh, when we're talking about the church, we've got to have a Pope who realizes that he's, uh, like all of us, like the, uh, all other uh, Christians, he's a Christian among others. So Augustine once said, you know, I'm a bishop for you, but I'm a Christian with you. And I think we want a Pope who's going to be a Christian with us, as a Pope for us. Um, now, I think that's all I want to say. We come to the last days of uh, Pope 
guy, Pope Benedict, and uh, it's been very moving, really. It's very, uh, people are greeting him, uh, in a sense, sadness that he's going, but understanding the reasons why he has resigned because of his infirmity and old age. And so we pray for the Pope, uh, and then we pray also for the, the for the cardinals and for those him who will be who will be a, a elected Pope within the next month. Thank you very much. Um, I was by John Royces. I just wanted to ask um, what the resignation of O'Brien yesterday means for the church, and is this overshadowing the search for the new Pope? I think clearly the, the, the circumstances of his resignation are, are, are very sad. And uh, I think, as I said, that uh, all those matters will be uh, investigated. I think that uh, you've heard that he's not going to the going to the, to the conclave. I think the cardinals will be discussing all these lots of issues uh, that concern reform in the church. That will carry on. I don't think the, the resignation of Cardinal O'Brien will affect that. Mm -hmm. And do you think um, the ability to reform the curia is one of the qualifications needed for the new pope? The, to, to reform uh, the the curia. The, cu the curia. The curia. Uh, well, I think that the clearly th th those who are in the curia, those who have helped the Pope, and that's got to be done. You know, I think there has to uh, clearly uh, there has to be a, a reform and a renewal there. And uh, why? Because it is a matter of governance, uh, and uh, governance needs to be needs to be well established. And uh, whoever is the Bertrand Commons, the governor of the Pope, has to have. A trustworthy assistance, and, uh, and so if that's if if there has been real difficulties in the curia, that has to be looked at. In fact, I seem to remember that the well, that the, the Pope appointed three cardinals to look in to some of the uh, some of the things that had been uh, asserted regarding uh, the curia, and they presented a Pope. Um, sorry, they presented a report to the Pope, which I don't know what's in it. I think the Pope's the only one who has seen it. So maybe we'll, we'll be talking about that too. Mm -hmm. And do you have any ideas of, of how you might be able to, to make those reforms? Well, I, I, suppose, I, suppose I would have a lot of ideas really, but uh, I think I'm not the Pope. Uh, I think that uh, the, uh, the, the Pope again will have the advice of the Cardinals. Uh, of how he might tackle this question. Mm -hmm. And one final question, sorry. Um, oh, do you, think, do you think the, the job, sorry, one fair. final one, do you think the, um, the job of the Pope has become too big and unwieldy for one man to take on? Uh, the Pope, as I've said, rules the church with the bishops. Um, there'll always be a Pope, there always has been, and there always will be. If um, Cardinal O'Brien has, as he insists, done nothing wrong, do you think it was right and necessary, or even wise for him to step down? Well, uh, that's, a good, that's a good question. I really don't know. It's up to his own conscience that he that he stepped down. He didn't. Uh, didn't. Uh, he wasn't asked to. He didn't. Uh, uh, he decided to do that. I, uh, as he said in his statement, I think he thought it would be a distraction uh, to be in Rome. I think that was the main reason because of the media attention that's been focused on him. But, uh, but in a sense, there's more media attention now because people and, and lay Catholics are wondering why a man would step aside if he genuinely has done nothing wrong. Yes, uh, well, uh, that was his decision uh, to do so. He wasn't forced to do so, he wasn't asked to do so. He thought, uh, given the publicity uh, of allegations, which, as you quite rightly say, uh, are being contested by, by the cargo, that was a, a better thing to do. Yes, yes. Uh, this, is, this is not just about uh, Cardinal O'Brien. Um, you mentioned in, in your opening speech there, there that uh, scandals need to be addressed. This is scandals in the United States, across the United States, in Italy itself. Britain is just part of this deeper malaise, at least the publicity of deeper malaise, that the Catholic Church is suffering at the moment. Do you think that when the Cardinals meet in, in Rome to elect a new Pope, that this issue, this issue of alleged cover-up is going to actually dominate the whole thing, which is why we're here this morning? I think that the Cardinals, when they meet for these 10 days, will be discussing not just uh, one particular incident or what happened uh, or uh, uh, allegations, but this whole, uh, the, some of the scandals that have, I think, afflicted the church. And I suppose the gravest one over the last years have been the scandal of uh, uh, regarding uh, protection of children. I don't know if this is a good, difficult question, but are these self-inflicted scandals in the sense that the, that the Catholic Church has not addressed them and are still not addressing them? Oh, well, I think they have to be, there's no doubt in my mind that there has to be reform, that, that these issues have to be addressed at the highest level, and not only by the Pope, but also by the bishops. And I think, I think that will be the, one of the main things the Cardinal it will be discussing. 
Um, you know, when a new when a, a new pope is elected, he knows he will know very well what what the cardinals uh, uh, have discussed, because he'll be part of the uh, of the discussions. So I think the new pope will go with a very clear mandate, and uh, I'm sure that the. Uh, uh, the, the new pope will, uh, will also be appointed with a view to a man who's capable of governing, not only those other qualities which I mentioned, but also capable of the kind of reform and renewal that's needed in, in the church at the present time. There have been difficulties, there have been scandals, they've got to be addressed. Because otherwise, I think there's no doubt, uh, and uh, it's something which obviously saddens me greatly, that the, the, not just the image of the church, but the effectiveness of the church in, in witnessing to the gospel of Jesus Christ, the good news, uh, is also effective. Um, you mentioned reform in the church. Uh, a lot of Catholics and priests have, been, have included marriage, celibacy, mandatory celibacy, whether we can ordain married men, uh, women's ministry. Will, will that be on the agenda for the next Pope? And well, I think, <coughs> I think that... Uh, uh, at the moment, uh, the celibacy is, is <coughs> mandatory, so, so, and uh, uh, and I may I just mention with regard to that well, that, that uh, uh, celibacy is, is not only uh, a man is meant to be uh, celibate; he's also meant to be chaste, uh, and therefore, whether, which all people are, and, uh, and uh, so uh, I think, uh, and whether there should be any d development with regard to ordination of married men. Uh, and that's a, there's a difference between ordination of married men and, uh, uh, and voluntary uh, 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 celibacy. Uh, I think that will be a matter that may may well come up sometime or other. It'll be up to the. I think it'll be up to the the Pope and the bishops to decide on on matters like that. There. I don't think it'll be first on the agenda of what we're talking about in the in the, the pre-conference. Right. Do you believe that the church's ability to transmit its message on issues such as gay marriage has been damaged by events in Scotland and the wider church? Well, uh, I don't know. I, I hope not, in a way. I mean, I think uh, the reason why the Catholic Church and, indeed, uh, our, our, our Anglican friends and others have been speaking about uh, <coughs> against a gay marriage uh, is really because of the word marriage, what we believe marriage to be. It's not in any way homophobic. <coughs> and, I would, and, and I regret it when some people are saying, well, we're just because we're against uh, uh, people who are so homophobic. That is not the point. The point is that for the stability uh, and uh, f f for the social life of a country, it seems to me marriage has one meaning of a lifelong relationship between a man and a woman. Uh, with the possibility of, of appropriation of children. Now, if you say marriage can also mean something else, I think that's not right. But that's not right. Sorry, one question. Which was your personal reaction after Brian and his ignition? Uh, were you surprised, uh, sad? Uh, well, obviously, I was very sad. <coughs> and uh, as I've said, I, you know, I don't know uh, anything about the, the details. And, uh, uh, and, uh, and I'm sure they, they'll be addressed, but certainly I was saddened. I, I know Cardinal O'Brien uh, well, and uh, so uh, I think it's been uh, it's been very sad. And uh, I think that uh, uh, what has happened, uh, both for him and for the Church of Scotland, has been very, very damaging. And uh, but I think uh, Cardinal O'Brien, uh, who is a very honest man, will will also whoever goes in will look at the, the allegations that have been made and he himself, as I've said, has contested them, contested them. So I think we have to leave it like that. Um, Pope Benedict's resignation appears to have been followed by a certain degree of disarray within the church. Um, is his, the Pope's resignation an example you think would be a good one for future Popes to follow? Um, well, there are lots of things one could say about that. I mean, I think that uh, the Pope's resignation, the first in how many, 800 years, is, is really quite uh, significant. And I think, in a way, it gives the Cardinals who are voting for the next Pope uh, perhaps more freedom. They could, so they say, we must have a younger Pope. Or, yeah, you could, have, you could also have an older Pope uh, with the possibility of, 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 of resignation. I think Pope Benedict... Uh, had indicated in many ways that uh, that a pope might have to resign, partly because 
of the age, of the disability, or any other reason. He had given the hints uh, that that uh, it might might uh, have happened. And the long, I suppose, the long period of the decline of Pope John Paul may have affected him in the last five years of Pope John Paul when he was so so ill and uh, not able really to to fulfil his uh, his office uh, fully. So I think there were good <coughs> many reasons which made him think we may have to resign. How it will affect uh, a future pope, uh, and uh, but clearly uh, the fact that a pope has resigned uh, uh, means that there's always that possibility. But I think I still think that uh, most Catholics uh, would like to think the pope continues; it will be able to continue till till he dies. And, uh, so it would have to be very exceptional, I think, if a pope uh, again retired. But it could happen. Okay. Right, Sam Jones from The Guardian. Um, two quick questions. I was just wondering when you learnt of Cardinal O'Brien's resignation, <coughs> first of all. Well, I only heard, I only heard when, he, when, he, when he announced it. In fact, he told, yes, he told me the night before that's what he was going to do. So the, the Pope decided to accept it. The decision was made apparently on the 18th, that it would take effect from the 18th of February. Yeah, I mean, obviously, a message must have gone to the Pope from the papal nuncio about uh, these allegations, and as he'd already resigned, and how he couldn't wait till the uh, 17th, because he'd be gone, and there wouldn't be a Pope, he decided just to put it back, uh, to, to, to accept it immediately. Now, now, whether that was because of the allegations, or for other, I, you know, I, I don't want to say. Okay, and just, just to follow up quickly, um, are you sure it was he, the Cardinal, chose to resign, or do you think he was pressured? given the allegations, given the proximity of conclave, maybe to, to go quickly? No, I think well, the Cardinal had already, had already submitted his resignation uh, uh, t three months ago, <coughs> in, uh, in November. So, and he had no idea then there was going to be uh, uh, a conclave. So it was already, he was already been accepted, his resignation it was to be implemented, as it were. There's something in the church called nuc pro tuc. In other words, uh, resignation is accepted, but it's not for uh, to, uh, the bishop doesn't actually uh, resign until uh, a particular a particular point, and so the uh, the pope brought back the the the, 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 the then uh, because of the, uh, the the new pope and the, uh, there wouldn't be a pope on the 17th of, of March, so that's why he said I'd, I'll accept it now. That's why the time frame changed. Hmm? That's that's why the time frame changed. Yes. Yes. Where would be your fondest memory of the outgoing, outgoing Pope's pontificate? What will stand out for you in your, in your, in your mind as the most, you know, the happiest moment or the most memorable one? I think, um, uh, uh, I have so many memories. I, I knew him, I knew him very well. Uh, uh, I, I, you know, I, I was absolutely thrilled about to go to Westminster Hall. And for everybody there, I was sitting opposite five prime ministers, and I haven't done that before, my ex prime ministers. And, uh, and, and then he was able to speak to uh, how many people there, a couple of thousand, uh, about, <coughs> about faith and reason, and by the way in which uh, religion in a society is so, so important. And that if you. Uh, uh, and, uh, and that each, as it were, nourishes the other. So he's not saying we're afraid of the secular world. He's saying we live in the secular world and we have a contribution to make. That would be one. Uh, 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 and then uh, another time, uh, uh, when I, early on, I met him with, uh, uh, before he was Pope, I met him with uh, uh, a group of uh, Anglican and Free Church leaders. This was after the visit of Pope. Uh, John Paul to this country, and I went with them. And the thing they wanted, all of the, we want to meet Cardinal Ratzinger. So we went in, and he greeted us so courteously. And then he said, "Had they any questions?" And believe you me, they they had uh, between them, they thought out the most difficult questions. So and one of, one I seen to the first one was a man called um, uh, the Archbishop of York, John Hapgood was his name in those days. And, and he asked a very difficult question. And then he waited for the Pope to, re not the Pope, Cardinal Ratzinger to reply. But the Cardinal said, no, no, let, let, you, know, you can all ask your question. And you know, they all asked their difficult questions. And, he had, and then for about a quarter of an hour, he answered them all, <coughs> but not with, with absolute brilliance and lucidity and honesty. And I thought to myself then, you know, that, that man's a great gift to the church. There are others who will do it more quietly. <laughs>
jumping from the Telegraph. Um, you mentioned earlier that um, Colonel O'Brien decided uh, voluntarily not to go to the conclave, and perhaps why he didn't want to be the focus of attention. Um, clearly, there are four or five other cardinals around the world with very serious shadows um, over their names at the moment. Might they also not be wise to, to ask themselves the same question about being the focus of attention? Well, that would be up to them, up to their own uh, conscience, whether they decide not to go to the conclave. I think I ought to say that there is a, an obligation on Cardinals to go to the, the conclave, so it will be a decision in their, their conscience. And, you know, all that and the troubles that there have been will be, again, matters that will be discussed by the Cardinals when they meet. Can I ask, um, how important do you think it is that Cardinals um, are new pope when he's selected um, is um, free from any kind of taint of, of cover-up that, that has affected so many communities throughout the world. I'm, I'm especially thinking of very recent comments by Cardinal Turkson um, about um, uh, whether such a cover-up could happen in Africa and um, he suggested that because of anti-homosexuality laws in Africa such a, such a scandal would never occur. Um, would, would it be... Do you, will you um, be advising that a new pope should be free of any kind of taint? Well, I think the, 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 the cardinals, when they're choosing new pope, as I've said, I will be there for the discussions and then I, go, I don't go in for the, uh, the election. But then they'll be thinking of a man of, of, of probity, I'm quite sure. Uh, and, and uh, uh, you know, you, you, you're not going to... You're not going to get a saint straight away, you know. I mean, and uh, we're all sort of we're all sinners. And, uh, but I'm sure that the man that the the man they elect will be of irreproachable uh, character. Uh, and uh, uh, as far as you can as far as you can say, and, and uh, so I, I've no worries about that. I have no worries about that. What do you think of Cardinal Texton's comments? Well, I didn't read them, I must confess. I like Cardinal Turkson. I met him, I, actually, just recently. And I said, you know, uh, Eminence, I can't open the newspaper without seeing your face. Uh, as, uh, <laughs> he's the sort of face of Africa, he's a, he's a lovely man. But I didn't, I didn't I read very much what he said. And Cardinal, do you regret that we won't have someone from the British mainland actually voting? And could you tell us why you think Archbishop Vincent hasn't been made a cardinal? Well, uh, I, I do regret it, yes. Uh, and, uh, uh, and I'm also very sorry that uh, my successor, Archbishop Nichols, has not yet been made a cardinal. Well, the main reason for that is, of course, me. I mean, if I were absolutely bloody, if I were dead, he would already be a cardinal. <laughs> but but the, the law is that uh, they didn't want to give uh, England or England and Wales, uh, more than one vote. And everybody under 80 uh, has a right to vote. So if he'd be made a cardinal, uh, then we'd, we'd have two votes. And, and that's why it's been delayed. But you I'm sure he will be a cardinal. You've only just turned 80, and the Pope obviously probably knew a couple of years ago that he was, might be planning this, judging by the gesture he made on the tomb of the last Pope to resign um, in this such circumstances 20 years ago, or to resign in a similar way. So if he was planning this, surely he should have planned for Vincent to be a cardinal by now, instead of, it almost looks like a deliberate snub. Oh, I don't think that. I don't think that's true at all. I think he's just abiding by the rules. Just abiding by the rules. And uh, I'm, I'm sure that uh, Archbishop Vincent will become a cardinal uh, before very long. Um, back, back, I'm afraid, to O'Brien. Uh, I can't think of, of another occasion when priests have made allegations. There are plenty of people in congregations have made allegations before, alas. But to have four priests. Isn't that what makes these as yet unproven allegations so significant and isn't that a turning <coughs> point that the church leadership has to deal with? We're actually now having allegations from within the priesthood. Well, I think, uh, uh, as I've said before, I really, in a way, don't want to comment. There have been allegations, the car is contesting them, they will be examined, and I think I'd, I'd like to leave it like that, really. Yeah, I'm wondering what your thoughts are on uh, bringing forward of the conclave, which the Pope has suggested could happen. Do you think they should wait for 15 days? Yes. Uh, uh, well, you, you, you've got to remember that the last time uh, uh, when Pope John Paul died, we had to wait a week nearly before the funeral. Uh, and, uh, and only then did we have, this time, there's, uh, there's no funeral. 
so the Cardinals will immediately go into their discussion. So they might well feel that instead of 15 days, they might be going, they might lessen it to 10 or 12. Uh, but some Cardinals, I think, think it should remain at 15. And so further, you know, given the given the situation, that we should fulfil, uh, <coughs> we, we, we don't need 15 days to do all the discussions that are necessary. But I think. Uh, I think uh, all the Pope has done is to say you can lessen it if you want to. So I'll know uh, <coughs> probably by the end of the week whether whether we're going to do that or not. Would you like 15 days? <laughs> well, I'm in a slightly different position from some of the others. I do know a lot of the cardinals, and uh, uh, maybe it could be done in 10. I haven't very strong feelings about it, but I wouldn't mind if it went on to 15. Any last question? No. Okay. Thank you. Well, may I just say before we conclude, you know, that, that uh, uh, sorry, uh, I just, I think, uh, I suppose I'm, uh, you know, I've been a, a, a bishop for 35, 36 years and uh, I'm a pastor for 56 years, or a priest, and I'm a, I'm a, I'm a man of hope, really. I, I really do, when you say we've, we have lots of troubles in the church, we have. There have been troubles in the past, and the church has been able, always able to, as it were, reform itself. There's a Latin tag which says, Ecclesia Semper Reformanda, and the church must always realize, uh, I say church, I mean people, and Christians that were weak and that were sinful, and that these things that happen, but they've got to be repented of, and also reforms have to be made. But I think if you were to say, am I very optimistic or hopeful for the church, of course I am. Uh, because I believe that the Holy Spirit is with the Church, uh, and that uh, it, it will be in the, the way it's not known to us with the Cardinals when they choose the uh, the next Pope. And uh, as I've said, uh, the, the Pope has a, uh, I think, a wonderful task of of, of teaching and preserving unity and truth. Uh, and so I, I am really very hopeful that, it, uh, in spite of difficulties, the Church will overcome them, will face them. Uh, and that the, the governance of the church will be secure uh, and it will continue uh, with its message of bringing the good news of Jesus Christ uh, to our world.